Okay, so previously we talked about approaching a machine learning problem, how we would approach a problem that was um, yeah, first defining the problem. The oh, it's horrible handwriting. Okay, so previously we were talking about how we approach a machine learning application. That was one defining the problem, then collecting or finding a good data set. Then we said we would choose an algorithm or algorithm class that we want to use to um, solve this problem. Then we would define an optimization metric for yeah training the model and then once we trained the model we would have an evaluation metric yeah, to evaluate the final performance of the model. Now we are talking briefly about different machine learning approaches and also motivations behind doing or using machine learning. So what different people hope to get out of machine learning. Petro Domingos, who is a professor at the University of Washington, has a very nice figure here, which I took from his book, The Master Algorithm, where he categorizes the different approaches to machine learning into five tribes. So he calls these tribes the symbolists, connectionists, evolutionaries, Bayesians, and analogizers. So here he's trying to categorize each tribe into um, a representation chosen yeah, for representing the model, an evaluation part, which would be the objective function we uh, talked about earlier. That's what we want to optimize during training. And then here, an yeah, optimization approach. So how we optimize the objective function. So don't confuse the eval here with the model evaluation metric, which is a little bit different. So the metric, like we said before, that we optimize during training doesn't necessarily have to be the same that we use to evaluate the final outcome, the final model. So here, let's just maybe have a look at one of these examples. For example, for the connectionists, Pedro Domingos classifies the, or set, um, defines the representation as neural networks, so that's the model for modeling the problem. Then the objective function would be optimizing the squared error. Of course, this is just one example. It could also be the cross entropy. Um, and then the algorithm or optimization approach would be using gradient descent. In neural networks, we usually use something called backpropagation, but it's based on gradient descent. And yeah, th this is how one type of machine learning would view the problem using a neural network model that is trained to optimize the squared error during training using the gradient descent approach. And then evolutionary would be using a genetic search as an optimization approach and optimizing the fitness and the representation of the problem or the model that would be the genetic programs. Or in a Bayesian uh, view, these uh, models would be graphical models and um, we use probabilistic inference for the posterior, maximizing the posterior probability, for example. So there are many different approaches to machine learning and I thought this might be a very nice overview slide. Of course, uh, each category only contains one example. Um, not, it's not an exhaustive li list of all the examples and models and representations for each category. So another interesting viewpoint is provided by Leo Breiman, who was a very influential statistician who developed yeah, very important algorithms such as decision trees and random forests, which we will cover later in this course. And if you have time, I really recommend reading this paper. It's called Statistical Modeling, the Two Cultures. It's, an, it's not a requirement for this course to read the whole paper, but I think it will open up some interesting yeah, insights into the relationship between statistics and machine learning. So he um, made the statement that there are two goals in analyzing the data. One goal is prediction and one goal is information. For example, if you have a scenario like here, 
where you have some observation of feature and some response variable or target as we call it in machine learning. The one goal would be to predict what the target or response is here for um, future input variables. So if we have a model that we fit to the training data, then at some point we want to make new predictions. We have features that we observe from new data examples. For example, if you think back of the email spam classification example, we fit the model on the training set, but at some point we really want to use the model on real data. So if we have a new email coming into our email inbox, we want to classify that as well. The other one, the other motivation is um, yeah, obtaining information. So to extract some information about how nature is associating the response variables to the input variables. So here this is more about understanding um, the relationship between X and Y. And you don't necessarily have to understand this relationship or what's called nature here perfectly in order to um, do predictions. So the goals sometimes overlap. So sometimes, of course, it's beneficial if you understand why a model is predicting certain outputs or what the relationship is between X and Y. Well, it's not always um, a requirement. For example, if I have a highly accurate spam filter, I have a spam filter that correctly classifies spam email all, all the time, 100% accuracy, then I don't really care about um, you know, what the relationship is or what makes a spam email. As long as the algorithm performs well, the, the decision uh, could be complex. I mean, it could depend on many different input features. A um, highly complicated um, model would associate a very yeah, complicated relationship there. But it's not necessarily important to understand this if it performs well all of the time. But there are, of course, very um, important applications where it is important to understand what the model is doing. But in any case, here I just wanted to... Um, say what Leo Breiman said, there can be two different goals in analyzing the data. Yeah, so in the statistical modeling culture or approach, what we have is we uh, have a given relationship where we have, we said before, this box was called nature, where there is a relationship between X and Y, that's some natural phenomenon, for example, and we want to model that. In statistical modeling, we would make an assumption. For example, there's a linear relationship between X and Y, and then we would use a linear regression model to model this. We can use that either to make predictions, but also yeah, to make assumptions and get information about the mapping between X and Y, or the relationship between X and Y. So that would be the approach that we yeah, would make in statistical modeling. In machine learning, we don't necessarily have to make assumptions about X and Y and um, the underlying model. There are certain types of algorithms that are just black boxes. So um, Leo Breiman calls this the algorithmic culture. So uh, he says, the analysis in this culture considers the inside of the box complex and unknown. So nature here is in reality often so complicated that we yet yeah, can't always make assumption also so we just consider that as a unknown function we don't really um, have to think hard about it and the approach is to find a function f of x that was our hypothesis x earlier which is an algorithm that operates on x to predict the responses y the their black box looks like this so Instead of assuming that nature behaves like a certain model, we just treat this as unknown and use an algorithm, for example, decision trees or neural networks um, that we fit on the training data and then we use it to make predictions on Y. We don't really need to understand the relationship between X and Y, we, we just care about the predictions. So there's a different approach to yeah, statistical modeling, that's the algorithmic approach. And this is essentially machine learning most of the time. So this would be a fun example of a problem that was solved without understanding actually the problem. So um, 
So this is a fun example here of a, a very extreme uh, algorithmic approach, like solving the problem without actually understanding it. And it also shows that it's not always necessary to understand the problem. Um, so I'm not sure if you've seen that before and if you have an idea what that is. So this is an evolved antenna that was designed by evolutionary algorithms. And this antenna here was used uh, on a NASA spacecraft. So they used algor uh, evolutionary algorithms to design an antenna with the best possible reception, basically. And it turned out that the algorithm found that this kind of antenna, although it looks super weird, um, yeah, performs very well. And this is, uh, we don't know why this antenna performs well, but actually it just performs well. And this is um, enough here to, use it on a NASA spacecraft. So it's not always important to understand what makes an antenna getting a better reception. But of course, if you have further insights into the problem, you can maybe even design better antenna. But yeah, this is just a example of an extreme approach where we consider the model as a black box and let it do its thing and get an outcome that actually performs very well in practice. Regarding black boxes and interpretability, some models are harder to explain or interpret and we usually call them black boxes. And some models are easier to interpret and these are usually, I mean, interpretability is usually desirable, but there's usually a trade-off. Uh, simpler models are easier to understand, but they usually don't give you a uh, great performance. Then on the other side, more complicated models may give you a better performance, but they are harder to interpret. And there are different levels of that and different sweet spots. And later in this course, we will see many examples of that where we have a deep decision tree that um, performs very well, except that it may overfit, but it is then very hard to interpret compared to a simpler, shorter decision tree. The shorter decision tree would have the problem that the predictions are not as accurate. So there's really the dilemma sometimes uh, between interpreting the model and the model performance. And I think also it doesn't really help if you have a highly, um, let's say, well-performing model, but sometimes um, it screws up in an important application. That's not good. But on the other hand, if you have a very simple model that you can understand, but it never predicts something very well, then also understanding the prediction is not very useful because you maybe don't end up using the model in practice because it's just not performing well enough. Regarding black boxes and interpretability, George Box, our department's founder, he said the following, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So that's maybe also something to always keep in mind. So another view on the different motivations for studying machine learning could be that engineers focus sometimes more on solving actual problems, uh, using machine learning as part of a solution to a problem. That could be self-driving cars where machine learning plays an important role. So solutions to real world problems, for example. Whereas some mathematicians, computer scientists and statisticians are more interested in developing machine learning theory, like understanding machine learning on a more fundamental level. Of course, I'm generalizing here. Doesn't mean that no engineer would um, care about ML theory. And it also doesn't mean that no computer scientist, statistician or mathematician would um, solve real world problems. So I'm just trying to group these different types of motivations roughly by, yeah, uh, kind of department here. So and some neuroscientists um, study machine learning because they're very interested in understanding how the human brain works and also um, trying to yeah, develop algorithms that mimic the human brain that could motivate the understanding of the human brain, but also it can help to improve algorithms if you use the human brain as a template, for example. So here that's more like, a, um, I would say more like a biological motivation. Okay, so we are, so in case you were already wondering, we talked about machine learning, but I many times mentioned the terms AI and deep learning. So what's the relationship between those? So originally, I mentioned that earlier, machine learning emerged as a subfield of AI. 
So we described machine learning earlier as algorithms that learn models or representations or rules automatically from data and examples. That was the principle behind machine learning. Then deep learning emerged as a subfield of machine learning relatively recently, like a little bit more than a decade ago. And this is a field that focuses on multi-layer neural networks. So multi-layer neural networks have been around for a long time, but deep learning, it also goes a little bit beyond just multi-layer neural networks, but also focuses on certain tricks to make the learning more efficient. However, in a way, deep learning is just a rebranding of the term neural networks. So this is not covered in, or deep learning is not covered in this course. This is a topic of statistics um, 453, which I usually teach in the spring semester. So AI, I draw that, I drew that circle here as an intersection between machine learning and AI and not machine learning as a subfield of AI because I think nowadays we have a lot of machine learning applications that are not necessarily AI systems. So I define AI systems as a non-biological system that is intelligent through rules. So systems that can be able to perform certain tasks that humans are usually good at, for example, driving, like self-driving cars or playing chess and things like that. But also image recognition, recognizing handwritten digits from images. I would call that AI systems. Uh, whereas machine learning, I mean, if you think back of the iris example, where we saw an example classifying different flower species based on simple measurements of the petal lengths and widths, if we use a simple k nearest neighbor algorithm, which we will talk about next lecture, I would call that a pattern recognizer, but I wouldn't necessarily call that an AI system. It's uh, I think it's a little bit too simple to call that an AI system. Um, in any case, there are many approaches to AI that are not machine learning. So you can also design an AI system by having human experts hand coding the rules. It can be tedious, but it can result in very highly efficient AI systems. So machine learning is not necessary for AI. So that is why uh, also I drew machine learning and AI as intersections because not all of machine learning is AI. And there are also many forms of AI that don't use machine learning. I realized this introduction is already very long, but I want to briefly just um, finish up with some topics uh, now here regarding with the tools that we are going to use. You probably already know that we will be using Python in this course. So here's just a quick overview of the tools we are going to use for or in Python. Because Python is a very powerful language. It's like a general purpose language. You can do a lot of things in Python, but uh, it's not known for being an efficient language in a way that if you just use vanilla Python, then it may be too slow for certain types of applications, which is why the scientific community developed many libraries on top of it that not only make it more convenient for scientific computing, but also way more efficient. So here I just want to show you a brief overview of the different tools that exist and that we maybe use or will be using in this class. This picture is based on a now five-year-old um, keynote by Jake Fenderblas, but it's still very accurate. This is really the core ecosystem in Python for scientific computing. We also sometimes call that the Sci stack, so the, um, the stack for scientific computing. And let me highlight some of these models that we will be using in this class and tell you what they are about. So Python is the programming language itself. Then there's something called IPython, which is an interactive interpreter. So it, it's just a way, um, it's a little bit more convenient to use Python through IPython, which is providing you some nice coloring in the terminal and stuff like that. I will show it to you actually um, next week. And on top of IPython, there is the Jupyter Notebook, which is just, um, if you have used R Markdown or R Studio, it's kind of like that. It's just like a program where you can execute Python and add notations. So these are not really Python libraries in a way for scientific computing. They are more like, um, like environments that make certain things more convenient. Now, however, there is NumPy, NumPy is one of the most important Python libraries. It's a linear algebra library. There are some additional nice functions in there, but fundamentally it's like a 
yeah, array and linear algebra library. And they implement algorithms very efficiently using Fortran and C code under the hood. So even if you call the function in Python or do a computation in Python, it's very fast because it uses Fortran and C code under the hood. However, it's uh, as convenient as Python because you actually execute Python functions. But we will see that in more detail also when we talk about NumPy next week. So I'll give you some examples and show you how to use NumPy. So SciPy is um, extending NumPy. There are some scientific functions in SciPy. So I would say this is like yeah, an advanced uh, a scientific library. So it has some more specialized um, functions that are uh, not in NumPy. Let's call it advanced scientific computing, something like that. There is matplotlib, which is a library for plotting, plotting data. And there is pandas, let me use a different color, pandas, which is I would call that maybe a data frame library. That's maybe a good description. Um, it's similar if you have used R, it's um, providing what uh, R's data frames are basically providing and some more things. So it's usually the go-to function for reading and writing data also. And yeah, also working with data frames. It's not always, um, or we don't always use that in machine learning, but for certain types of the workflow, it makes things easier. So for example, for data pre-processing, for collecting data and cleaning up data, pandas can be very convenient. There are, other, uh, there are other libraries here, but we won't be using them in these course. So the ones that I highlighted here are the main libraries. Oh wait, I forgot one very important one, and that is um, scikit-learn. This is of course our machine learning library. So that is the mach main machine learning library that we will be using here. Um, also, you notice that in this plot or in this graphic, uh, Jake Venaplas drew these lines here, so these divider lines. It also tells us a little bit about the level of how the libraries are related. So at the core, there's Python. And let's say um, NumPy is built on top of Python. SciPy, in turn, is built on top of NumPy. And scikit-learn is essentially built on top of SciPy and NumPy. So SciPy makes heavy use of SciPy and NumPy. And in that way, also usually libraries in the scientific uh, Python ecosystem, they benefit each other. They are all interoperable. So you can usually export back and forth between NumPy and Pandas. Nowadays, scikit-learn also um, accepts inputs from Pandas and we can also, Pandas uses also Matplotlib for their own uh, visualization tools and uh, so forth. And Matplotlib works with NumPy. They're all connected with each other. So the ones that I circled, um, NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, and Scikit-Learn will be the ones that I will show you next week and that we will be using that course. And we will also using in this course uh, Jupyter Notebooks because they make teaching and um, yeah, tutorials, writing, providing you with material more co convenient because I can write some text in there, but then at the same time we can also have code in there. And we will also be using Jupyter Notebooks for the homework where I will give you some example code that is, let's say, unfinished. I will give you some instructions, maybe some figures, and you will then uh, yeah, write your code in, in the homework, uh, the homework code in the Jupyter Notebook. And then you can also add your results, add some explanations and so forth. So it's a very convenient environment here also for this class. We are almost at the end of the lecture, some more additions I wanted to make. So we talked about spam classification earlier, so in the context of emails. So you were probably wondering, what is uh, why do we call spam email spam? It's actually inspired by this food, which is a food that was made, I think, like uh, during the Second World War or something, to have some food that can be easily preserved. It's still very popular in Hawaii. Um, I saw that a couple of times there. I don't know why it's still so popular. I think it's probably delicious, but maybe not the most healthy food. Anyways, um, the reason uh, why spam email is called spam is that the Monty Python group, it's like a comedy group from like many, many years ago, was a little bit before my time, but they performed 
certain sketches about spam many many times so i guess it became uh, annoying at some point and then when there was a time when email was invented and to pick a name for these uh, kind of unsolicited electronic messages they just uh, picked the name spam for it because it was inspired by this annoying yeah referencing of spam in the sketches uh, how is this related to python now because i just talked about python actually uh, it all comes back full circle because Python itself is inspired by Monty Python. So that's the sketch group. So even though Python has a snake as a logo, originally Python, the name came from this Monty Python comedy group. So here I also have this from Wikipedia. Python's name is derived from the British comedy group Monty Python, whom Python creator Guido van Rossum enjoy, enjoyed while developing the language. So here we go. So there's actually a direct relationship between uh, Monty Python and Python and spam and Monty Python. So it all goes back to Monty Python. Anyways, um, okay. So lastly, just to wrap up some of the terms we covered today, let me briefly recap uh, the ML terminology that we talked about. The hypothesis is a certain function that we believe or hope is similar to the true function, the target function that we want to model. So when we think back of our setup, so we have some input feature x, some function f, and then some output y. And f is, let's say, the label providing function, some function that actually yeah, provided us with a label. So that could be even a human um, assigning spam and non-spam emails. In our machine learning algorithm, wants to learn or should learn a model that can provide the same mapping well. So in the email spam classification example, approximating the spam and non-spam label assignment that the human would do. So we would have a model that we call that H hypothesis in machine learning that would do the same mapping or approximates this mapping. So in a way, the hypothesis is an approximation of this target function. and Traditionally, people say or call this the hypothesis. Nowadays, it's more, I would say, common just to use the term model. They are kind of interchangeable. In other sciences, also, hypothesis means something very different. So it can be even confusing to use the term hypothesis, I think. So, for example, I may have a pharmaceutical drug and I may have the hypothesis that there's no significant difference between a control group and a treatment group who takes the drug. So that is a different type of hypothesis that has nothing to do with machine learning, for example. So yeah, just the bottom line is um, hypothesis and model are kind of interchangeable and they are both the thing that we want to approximate. So the learning algorithm is the algorithm that learns the model from the data set. So I have provided you here with a little more detail just to summarize what we talked about in this lecture. So here I'm, in this slide, I'm pretty detailed. It's just more you, for your personal reference. I don't want to read that all out loud. And a classifier would be a special case of a model. So the learning algorithm is used on the training set to produce the model. And if the data set happens to be a classification data set where we have class labels for y, for example, the spam and not spam example, that would be a classification case. So we would call that specific model a classifier. Yeah, but this is just a brief recap and some reference for you, like to clarify some of the terms we covered today. So in this course, um, I try to structure it into seven parts. We have the introduction, which was partly covered today. So next lecture will be the introduction to k-nearest neighbors, like the first supervised learning algorithm that we will cover in this course. Just to give you a taste of machine learning and a machine learning application, so how a machine learning algorithm works. And then uh, we will cover computational foundations. We'll talk a little bit more about um, yeah, NumPy, how to use NumPy and scikit-learn, the machine learning library. But of course, like I mentioned earlier, it would be highly recommended if you have not used Python yet to really uh, look or work through some of the resources that I provide you here in this um, first week. I will add that to the Piazza page also, uh, to the Canvas page. 
So after we cover the computational foundations, we will go back to machine learning and talk uh, about tree-based model uh, methods and models. This will also uh, include model ensembles like um, random forests and boosting algorithms. After that, we will talk about model evaluation. So we will uh, spend a lot of time discussing how we properly evaluate machine learning models because it's a very important topic and um, it's kind of fundamental to know how we evaluate a machine learning model before we can set it loose in the real world. So I think that's a very important uh, topic that we should um, pay close attention to. Then we will talk a little bit about dimensionality reduction and unsupervised learning, including clustering. After that, I hope we still have time then to talk more about Bayesian learning. This will be the last part of the core lectures here in this course and then lastly you will be giving the presentation so i will provide you again more uh, with more detail about the class projects later i talked a little bit about this in the beginning but i will send around more resources also so that will be then the time uh, the last few uh, lectures or weeks last two weeks where you will be giving your presentations about your awesome pr class projects yeah uh, also here it's the same thing just in more detail. The next um, lecture will be the introduction to supervised learning and k-nearest neighbors. Then in part two, we will talk about Python, uh, Python scientific computing stack like NumPy, and then data processing and machine learning with scikit-learn. So that's just part one and two in more detail here. So lastly, some reading assignments. So I really recommend uh, reading the first chapter uh, of the Python machine learning book. It's very short, but it's like, a, I would say maybe more accessible introduction than the course notes. It's a little bit shorter. I highly recommend you to read the course notes though, which summarize what I just talked about. So I was just writing down what I had in my slides in, in more detail, also maybe more clearly at some points. Another helpful book, it's uh, freely available online, um, is elements of, uh, elements of Statistical Learning. It's not required that you read that, but it's, uh, I would say, a little bit more formal than the Python machine learning book, or actually way more formal. So if you prefer that style, I recommend uh, reading Elements of Statistical Learning, the first chapter. And optionally, if you like, I recommend Liu Bryman's paper that I referenced earlier in this lecture. It's very nice, uh, accessible, paper you don't need much background knowledge for understanding what he's talking about uh yeah but again this is not a requirement it's just an optional reading assignment for you so we'll maybe call this optional and this optional of course to some degree this is also optional it's just for you it can help you but i don't uh, i won't ask you any questions about this chapter for example in the exam so you don't really have to read it it's just for your own benefits if you like all right so that's it for week one next week we will or lecture one in the next lecture we will talk about k nearest neighbor algorithms